Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Megatons are on the way panel. I'm glad you all are here. And uh, I'm Wendy Lou McGill, the, the um, executive director for the International Biochar Initiative. And um, we're really excited to start that. It's really um, a great privilege to have a panel that will be showcasing the rapid scaling of the global biochar industry. And um, we know that while there's been really brisk growth in the past couple years, we uh, also know that we need to go even a little bit faster. And I did want to mention that the International Biochar Initiative will be releasing a global uh, market research report in February for the biochar industry. So that'll be on our website, biochar-international.org. Um, we're really fortunate to have some live case studies, if you will, from the four companies that are represented here that are showcasing the different aspects or several different aspects of scaling the industry. Um, we will hear about scaling production technologies, about a very large facility that's being built in Canada, a transition project that's transitioning away from fossil fuels into um, biochar production, and finally work in the UK on an ecosystem, on ecosystem protection that's added on top of the biochar production as well as the carbon removal from biochar production. Very quickly, please save your questions for all of the panelists at the end. We will have time for Q&A, but we're going to go ahead and let everyone present first. And now I'd like to quickly um, get to the panelists and do an introduction. We first will hear from Helmut Gerber, who's, of course, the co-founder of Pyreg, founded in 2009, which was a spin-off from the Technical University in Bingen. He's responsible for, for development, plant engineering, and renewable energies. And he also developed the Pyreg core plant technology. He is, of course, a pioneer in the industry with a large number of scientific publications and research projects. We will then be joined by Lilia Kinash, who is with, uh, of course, is the Vice President of Climate Solutions for Arex. She uh, is, prior to this, was the head of the Integrated Risks Management at Hydro-Quebec and is one of the largest producers, which is one of the largest producers of hydroelectricity in the world. We're also joined by Connor Layden, who's the commercial director for Ireland-based Arigna Fuels, which is a majority family-owned and operated business in the west of Ireland that is transitioning from having fossil fuel-based products to biochar manufacturing. And finally, Sebastian um, Byrne, who's the head of engineering with ONU. He started working in biochar after finishing university in 2011 and started working for, at that time, Carbon Gold in research and development on batch kilns. He went on to complete the installation and commissioning of a number of biochar kilns around the world and is now the head of engineering at ONU. So we will hear first from Helmut. Yeah, thank you for the introduction. Um, as you can see, I will talk about scaling up biochar production plants to meet uh, the increasing need for carbon dioxide removal. So that's what we can see <coughs> in the market right now. And uh, I started, and that's the, the maybe the next slide uh, about Pyrec. Myself, 99, as a researcher at the University of Bingen, which is in the Frankfurt area in Germany. And um, uh, a little bit afterwards, I entered in the first pyrolysis and gasification uh, research project, um, which didn't work quite well. And I came up with another idea, which we call today in Pyrec. Uh, it was 2003, uh, patent in 2005, and made a spin off from the university in 2009. Um, now we are 100 people working at Pyrec and, and delivered more than 50 plants. And what we can see in the market in all this time that the demand for bigger system is just growing. We have uh, started with a small system, which is just natural, decentralized uh, plants. And now the customers are getting bigger, the demand is bigger, so we need a uh, bigger plants because it's just economy of scales and uh, efficiency and so on. So 
and uh, we focus into that. And um, that's the, the system we have now, um, uh, more or less the, the, the process itself is unchanged. It's a screw reactor followed by a combustion chamber and a special type of combustion is the flameless oxidation combustion. And uh, we adapt this system to different feedstocks uh, uh, ju just by ch changing, uh, for example, which you can see here optional is a scrubbing system for, um, for polluted uh, biomasses like sewage sludge. We have to scrub out, uh, for example, mercury and so on to fulfill uh, strict emission laws like in California and Germany, and Europe, everywhere. So that's the basic system. And on the left side, you can see our current biggest system. That's the PX1500. It's more or less like 10 meters wide and 15 meters long and six meters high. And uh, that's uh, our current product. And the question was, how can we scale up? Do we do it the same way with a screw reactor? Or do it, do, do, could we do something else? And um, yeah, that's I described already uh, what we do. Um, just maybe this might be interesting. Uh, we use really different feedstocks. So that's what this was the goal of my uh, research that we uh, tried to um, just find a system which can handle all types of biochars or all types of materials because my gasification plant uh, uh, which uh, I started in 99 was only able to handle uh, wood chips from a decent size and interesting for me was to, to just enter all these uh, waste uh, material uh, topics and build a system which can handle almost everything you can see here. If it's lobby waste from a fast food restaurant or it's uh, sewage sludge or can be olive pits or whatever you can think of, baby nappies, uh, we, we tried pyrolysis and, and shredded windmills and whatever you think about, we, we already had it in our machine. <coughs> so that's common, it's just uh, maybe someone hasn't seen it, so we have problems with the climate and uh, if we want to um, fight against it, we uh, have to reduce carbon dioxide emissions, but they have to be negative emissions as well uh, to follow the path. So I think this is common knowledge uh, nowadays. There are different ways to do it, um, and the biochar solution is one of them. Uh, actually, it's the biggest one. So, um, so and this is uh, just take, taken from EBI. I'm also a member in the BBI, EBI, European Biochar, uh, industry consortium, one of the founders there. And um, so this is our solution it, and it makes at the moment one of the biggest biggest stakes in, in carbon dioxide removal. <coughs> yeah, for these uh, um, uh, uh, people in the auditorium who, who maybe not know what is pyrolysis, it's something everyone knows because if you light a match like uh, you can see on in this uh, photo, and uh, you can see pyrolysis uh, just uh, in front of your eyes. And you also can see the, uh, the combustion of the gases uh, which were created by pyrolysis. And uh, everyone who does pyrolysis in a, a commercial plant does more or less the same, just puts it in, in a different you know, bin or wherever in a type of machine. And what we did just separate um, the pyrolysis itself where we char the, uh, the bio biomass from the combustion. We have a combustion system and we have a pyrolysis uh, system and just combined them. <coughs> um, yeah, that's about carbon dioxide removal or, or how this works. Uh, so we don't remove the carbon dioxide from the, the atmosphere. Um, the plant does it uh, with photosynthesis, does it very efficient and all the time. And if we uh, just take the plant and uh, just avoid that it is degraded by bacteria or something else uh, and uh, take maybe the residues from the plant and put it in the machine, then we just can c create this uh, effect and, and use uh, the biochar itself for p uh, several purposes like in the soil and also create carbon uh, credits. Uh, putting it in the soil uh, is, is good, is a good idea. There is a lot of research done the la last 10 years. I was uh, also involved because um, uh, a lot of these biochars went into the research, came from us uh, that early time. And uh, this is one of the newest uh, meta studies and you can clearly see it. this is over thousands of uh, field studies and trials and so on. There is a, uh, there's an 
<coughs> in every case, a good effect of biochar on water holding ca capacity in the soil, on growth of roots, of uh, um, crop, and so on and so on. And uh, on the other side, uh, the biochar will hold, uh, stop leaching, hold uh, uh, nitrogen, and also um, if there is um, heavy metals in the soil, it will, will uh, the, hev the so uh, heavy metal will not be bioavailable. So there's a lot of good things uh, if you put it in the soil as one possibility. Now coming into scaling up, there's interesting paper of Hans-Peter Schmidt, who is also one of the pioneers in this industry. I met Hans-Peter, I think it was, I don't know, 15 years ago or even longer. And he wrote, uh, um, in, his in the journal, he wrote an article uh, 2021 about upscaling uh, and the need in the future, what he estimated as one of the, let, let's say, popes of biochar, uh, what he estimated as a standard machine. And uh, you can see it written there. That he, he, sa he said, okay, the standard project might be 10,000 tons of biomass uh, product uh, input per year. And uh, that's what we, we took as a as a value because we, we were able to see in our projects that that's, that's the actual demand uh, for projects uh, from the industry, which we, we were faced to. And there you can see it in, um, uh, in a table uh, together with the systems we already have. We have the 500 and the 1500, and the 1500 takes up to 3,000 tons, 2,500, 3,000 tons. So we have to scale it up by factor four. And uh, this, is, this was the goal. And the question is how to do it and how the biochar should be. And uh, there you can see um, some of the interesting points uh, we think our biochar proper, uh, properties should be. So there is this, uh, you can see the Van, Van Cravelin diagram is quite common. You can see the borders of uh, EBC. So we, we have to fulfill some decent H to C ratio to get into the EBC limits. <coughs> And um, this needs we, uh, means we need uh, some temperatures around 450, at least 450, up to 700 degrees. So we have to build a machine which can handle biochar in this temperature range. And uh, we have the opportunity, Professor Hamad Sane is here, that, so that's your slide. <laughs> and uh, we can see also from the very newest uh, sci science, that if you stay in this temperature range, it's, it's, uh, it's very usual that you get a biochar which is very, very stable. And it's called inertinite and will be stable for millions of years. So we want to stay in this temperature range. For, for me as a technician, okay, goal is 600 degrees. <coughs> um, we can see this also in very old, um, this is from Johannes Lehmann from Cornell University, old publications. There seems to be an optimum uh, thinking in other areas like surface area and also carbon recovery is, is also interesting, uh, cation uh, exchange capacity and so on. So he already declared there's an optimum, it's around five to 600 degrees, so that's the temperature range where we want to stay in. Um, also, you can make different types of pyrolysis. We, we know the kiln types of pyrolysis, um, <coughs> just uh, you, you can, feed up air, the, so the process is exothermal, the, it, it, do, it does it on itself. You can heat it from outside, uh, you can, can look at uh, the wow uh, machines here, they're, they're, some of them are heated from outside with uh, uh, just put the heat inside the reactor. What we do with Pyrec, uh, we just take uh, the heat from the combustion chamber, which you can see at, at the right, and recycle it into the reactor and heat the reactor, the reactor this time, th this, this way. Also what is important is the resonance time. Um, this is also taken from literature. You need a decent resonance time. If the resonance time in the reactor is very, uh, if, if you have a really quick reaction, and that this you can see on the left table on the left side, the plaque fraction gets very uh, small. So it's better to have intermediate to long uh, uh, pyrolysis, uh, which might, uh, uh, need 10 minutes, maybe to 15 minutes at least, uh, to get more carbon out of it. Um, and you can see it on the right table, it's taken from other literature, it's more or less the same. So we need a decent residence time. <coughs> and there are some uh, yeah, classical solutions how you could, could do this. You have the Harrisoft reactor, the rotating head, head uh, reactor, which uh, fulfills all this, um, yeah, 
the standards w which, which you uh, should involve. You also have the rotating drum reactor. There are a lot of solutions out, out there which use the rotating drum. It's not new. You can see this is maybe from the 1500s. It's really old picture. Um, it's well-known technology. It works. So this is one solution we also looked into. And um, there is the screw reactor, and there are a lot of companies using screw reactors involving Pyrex, involving uh, Wow, and so on. And uh, that's one of our oldest prototypes, 2007. I just found this photo looking into my computer. This was at a wastewater treatment plant in Germany, the first wastewater plant, uh, uh, pyrolysis um, pilot plant we built outside the university. <coughs> so after a long uh, time uh, looking into different technologies, we decided to st uh, stick with a screw reactor. And there's only one problem. You cannot make the screw reactor as big as you want. So it, it will just deform. It will uh, get in trouble. And uh, you will prob have problems uh, to get heat inside because the surface area and the volume have different exponents. So it's, it's a little bit tricky. And we s decided to use multiple reactors. And then it's the question, and this, that's just engineering, how you arrange these uh, eight, up to eight reactors, how, how many uh, filters do you need, how many, many flaps you need, and so on. So the, we, we are in this process at the moment, do a lot of engineering, CF, CFD simulation, construction work, uh, um, calculations, and so on. Uh, we have to build the whole ele uh, electrical thing around it, uh, uh, and uh, the time planning is now to start uh, building the plant in summer, have it ready uh, next summer for the first operation, and uh, to sell the first plant next year, uh, which is this size. Uh, you can see the, the first mock-up from this 10,000 tons plant and uh, the size of my daughter on the right side <laughs> <laughs> and someone else, I don't know, on the left side. <laughs> um, yeah, as a comparison and yeah. That's that's it for today. <laughs> Thank you. So thank you. It was a really great presentation. <laughs> uh, if I shift, let me just wait. My presentation is on. Maybe I can start by presenting myself. Donc, euh, bonjour tout le monde. Euh, je viens du Québec, donc je parle français, mais aujourd'hui, je vais faire un effort et je vais faire ma présentation en anglais. <laughs> so, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Lilia Kenash. It's been a bit less than a year uh, that I embarked on the biochar journey on a professional way. And um, I am now uh, engaged with Erex Energy on the biochar quest. And today, I will talk to, to you about the Carbonity project. So it's for now, I think we can say it's a benchmark uh, for the industry. So it's a, quite a big project we do. But uh, I have to be honest, I hope that in the future, this project will be overtaken by other projects. So as uh, many people mentioned since yesterday, in order to have climate relevance, we need to upscale. So here, I think competition is fine, but collaboration is key. We need to work together. And you, you'll see a great example in terms of the Carbonity project. It is really a project uh, based on the narrative of collaboration, working together. So I think it's a message I want to deliver to the industry. Uh, we're there on the fight against climate change. We're not here to have uh, egos fighting against each other. Uh, I think the mission is larger. So. I think that was something important to be mentioned. So I will talk about the project from the Eric's energy perspective. But of course, as I mentioned, we are many players on this project. Uh, essentially, our mission, probably the same mission as many other here, uh, the goal is to uh, reduce the impact of climate change by providing, uh, well, by providing world-class decarbonization technology. So that's what we do. We want to do it for the future of current generations, future generations. This is the Erex Energy timeline. So since its creation, uh, so basically the story started in 2010. 
it was not Eric's energy at the time. It was Eric's industry. So it's a big industrial player in Canada doing equipment for dust collection, these kinds of industrial processes. And at the time, the CEO uh, started doing research and development on torrefaction technology, seeing a potential for bio coal replacing fossil coal in thermal plants and so on. So he started with a bio coal experimental pilot unit with a really small yield of 10 kilograms an hour. Uh, they then worked on the first biochar pilot unit, again, very small yield. And since then, it's all about scaling up. So uh, 2012, the first bio coal pilot unit of 100 kilograms an hour, so still 10 times from the previous one. Uh, in 2014, they basically decided, yeah, it's worth trying it out. So uh, the CTO of Eric's industry embarked on the journey. Eric's Energy got created as a company really focusing on terrifaction pyrolysis technology. In 2016, there has been the inauguration of the first bio coal commercial plant. So 2.5 tons of bio coal per hour being produced. Since then, we have many uh, clients all over the globe. So we're exporting the bio coal uh, for thermal plants, but SAF Sustainable Aviation Fuel, now they're being interested into this process. So it's larger scale. And in 2023, it's the beginning of the construction of the carbonity plant in Parc Cartier. And this is the project I will talk to you about a bit further. So the technology basically, of course, as many other technologies, recognized, patented. Uh, we are trying to have products addressing many challenges of decarbonization with a goal to reduce uh, CO2 emissions from industrial processes of cement, mining industry, al uh, aluminum, uh, metallurgical industry, but also having carbon removal with biochar. So that's the process mostly for pyrolysis. The process for torrefaction is a bit different. So I'll go more in the details with the technology. So here we have the carbon FX six tons per hour. This is basically the bio coal plant I was talking to you about a bit later, uh, earlier that we are replicating at a larger scale. So the project is uh, under planning right now for having this six tons per hour uh, unit for bio coal. So of course, bio coal, it's not pyrolysis, it's torrefactions. So it's a lower temperature and we do flash pyrolysis. So we flash the residual biomass within uh, the, the screws, the cyclonic reactors. And the yield is bio coal, of course. So other technologies, so it's the carbon FX high temperature. So this is for biochar in Parc Cartier, uh, the Carbonity project. This is the technology that will be used. So we developed a system leveraging the carbon FX for bio coal, and we kind of slightly changed the process to make sure we had a pyrolysis system. So it's slower, gradual pyrolysis. The residence time is longer. So it's not within second like bio coal, and it's higher temperature, so 600 degrees. And the yield can be biochar or biocarbon. In terms of drying technology, we had some struggle uh, challenge with conventional dryers. So our CTO had to uh, invent ours. <laughs> and uh, so it's a drying solution to make sure that there's security of the, of the process, no burning, no biomass accumulation uh, in the dryer. Uh, and it's also high efficiency, low cost. We even sell it to wood makers that uh, are not doing biochar. So it's actually proved that, that it's successful. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we really can do it all on our own. We have tons of research and development partners. Of course, those are mostly from Quebec region. Uh, so a lot of university, a lot of research centers. Uh, we work with JECA Environment. We work with the University of Sherbrooke. So those research projects are mostly to characterize our biochar, but also test different biomasses, uh, certification, making sure that we are rigorous in our process and that we do it at the state of the art. Uh, that's mostly the focus. So the project, 
uh, Carbonelli. So as I mentioned earlier, you see three logos. These are the three partners uh, doing this project right now. So what you see here, it's in Parc Cartier. So it's Northern Quebec. I'll show you a bit later the map. So it's gonna be a 30,000 tons biochar project a year at the, the end. So basically we'll do in phases. We'll have the first phase, the second phase. Approximately 27 employees, so quite low, uh, not much employees, and a lot of the employees from the sawmill nearby will be hired on the project. Uh, so uh, quite a big footprint and uh, $80 million uh, investment. So I think it's important to say here that we're trying to do the best project ever, uh, the all the, the machineries, the technology, they are in-house produced. So we really have a big quality control because it's the first project. So before doing it in replication perspective, we want to make sure it's high quality. So that's why it's quite a big investment. So it's the first and only industrial biochar production plant in Canada, perhaps the largest in North America. We don't have much visibility on the others. Uh, but we believe it's quite a big project. Uh, something interesting. Oh, I think it's fine. <laughs> so, uh, oh. so this project is the activation also of, uh, I don't know if you can go back. It's kind of changed on its own. Just sorry, I'll try to uh, put it, oh, here you go. So this project is the activation of a major partnership we have with Suez. Actually, we have a common ambition to develop, to produce 350,000 tons of biochar a year by 2035. So the, the ambition is to basically replicate the Parc Cartier project every year by 2035 so we can sequester uh, the, the, the carbon from the, the project. So, it's ambitious, but we need to have ambition if we want to, uh, you know, do uh, real work and uh, try to save the planet a bit from our end. Uh, this project is born from a joint venture between Erex Energy, Suez Group, and Gros Prémabec. I will talk to you about the players a bit uh, further down. And what I like about this project is that it's really isolated, remote area in Quebec, and it secures the assigning activities of the local partner. Uh, it's a region where there's not much uh, big employers. And the fact that we arrived, because they used to sell their residues to a pulp mill nearby, and the pulp mill shut down. So they couldn't uh, get rid of their residues. So the project is kind of saving this activity for the remote partner, and this is really interesting for them as well. Uh, the start of the operation will be in November 2024. So stay tuned, it's gonna come. <laughs> so why, why located in Parc Cartier? So here you have a map of Quebec. So basically, six France fits into the Quebec province. So it's a very large territory. You can see south in Ontario, you have Toronto. A bit northern, you have Montreal. And the yellow area is Parc Cartier region. So it's very high, but there's a lot of forest biomass residues, and that's why it's a strategic positioning for us to get there. It's also strategically positioned near deep sea ports for a shipment, uh, efficient shipment to uh, European uptakers, for example, of the biochar production. And uh, we have a long-term sawmill residue supply from the feedstock partner. So it, it's a great project. So this project relies on uh, three value drivers. So you need approximately 210,000 forest residues. Uh, in the north, it's uh, coniferous residues to uh, have the three lines of uh, carbon FX being fed to produce 30,000 tons of biochar a year. There's also capacity to produce biocarbon. This will induce approximately 75,000 of credits for carbon removal. This is also based on the life cycle analysis. So it's depending on the project. Other projects will have different uh, yield in terms of carbon removal credits. 
And what is interesting here is also the circularity of the project. So on this specific project, we'll condense the excess energy. So of course, some of the energy is recirculated within the process, so we don't get it back to the air. So all the drying of the biomass is made from the excess energy of produced by the biochar production. The excess, because there's still some excess, will be condensed into a bio oil. This bio oil needs to be filtered. On the site of the sawmill, there is a player uh, called the Bioenergy AE, and they have a filtration uh, unit for bio oil already. So we'll sell them the bio oil, and they can sell it afterwards to a big mining uh, player nearby within 10 kilometers. So it's a very circular project, and it's quite interesting in the sense that there's not much uh, transportation being done uh, for the outputs of the project. So the timeline, so the, the project got launched this summer. Construction started in October this year. In November uh, 2024, production, the line one will be started, but we're not launching all the lines at the same time, so it's two phase. And 2025, we'll do the final investment uh, decision for the two other lines. And in 2026, it's going to be fully operational for the three lines. So here are some photos. Of course, politicians. So this is the Quebec Super Ministry of uh, Energy, Natural Resources uh, being there with one investor, our CEO Michel, uh, Yves Ranou from Suez, and the CEO Régent Paris from uh, Gros Primabec, which is the sa local sawmill. Uh, we did a retrofit. So we didn't have to build the whole building. It was already there. Uh, it was empty, so we just needed to do the whole retrofit. You can see the size, it's huge, and you don't even see it all. It's a very big uh, footprint. Uh, and then you can see that uh, this was a photo two weeks ago, so a lot of snow, Northern Quebec, <laughs> a lot and a lot of snow, and it's very cold. <laughs> So the association basically here, so feedstock access. So what is great about this project is that we basically work together. Uh, what I like is that the Gros Primabec is a very old uh, forestry player of Quebec, and they have been progressive enough and long-term thinking enough to inv involve themselves in such a you know, futuristic project, let's say, uh, with their residue. So I think this is uh, very great from them. In terms of technology, so we are the technology equipment provider. And the market access, this is also very great. So we are partnering with Suez, which is the European industrial group. And they are bringing with us their knowledge, uh, support with commercialization, and thinking for replication of the project. So uh, I think it's a really great association. So I'm not going to go very long on the products. I think you've been hearing a lot about biochar, biocarbon applications. So I think I'm just going to shift quite quickly. But we also already have some purchase agreement more into the topsoils or culture uh, area. And uh, yeah, and of course, biocarbon applications are also there, potential for biochar uh, applications. So thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed the talk. <laughs> Good afternoon. I'll wait for the slides to come up. Thanks. Sorry, I, I hope I won't speak too fast, but I'm Irish, so you have to forgive me. Um, so, so yeah. I'm, good afternoon. I'm Connor Layden, and I'm the commercial director in Arigna Fuels, um, and we've recently commis commissioned one of Europe's largest operational biochar plants. So, I'm here today to tell you how we came from a coal mining company to getting to the biochar journey. So, about the company, so. How do we get to where we are? Who are we effectively? So Arigna Group is made up of two companies, Arigna Fuels and BL Fuels, so one in Ireland and one in the UK. Um, we have five sites across Ireland and the UK, um, mainly in Scotland and the UK, um, and we're headquartered proudly in Arigna, County Roscommon, Ireland. It's a rural area in, in, in Ireland. Um, there's not a whole lot around us, but we're there, <laughs> and I'll tell you why we are in a few minutes. Um, we have 75 employees across the group, 
and we've about a 15 million turnover at present. Um, we are a fifth generation family business with some outside investments, so I'm proudly a fifth generation of the business, so um, I don't know if I'm crazy or, or not. But um, So how, how do we get to where we are today? So our history is, is one of adoption and evolution, effectively. We, we started out as a mining company um, all those years ago, back in the 1900s. So my great-great-grandfather um, started out, and we, we took the coal out of the mines in, in Roscommon and supplied the, the local power station at the time. Well, not at the time, but as time moved on. Um, however, as time moved on, the coal deposits um, diminished and technology evolved, and we decided quickly that we'd have to pivot the business. Um, and so that's where we made our first pivot. Um, so what we started doing in the late 80s, early 90s, was we started manufacturing low smoke coal briquettes. Um, and the low smoke coal briquettes were used to service the domestic solid fuel market in Ireland and the UK. Um, so we built a, a 70,000 ton per annum uh, hot cure coal processing plant, which would run 24 hours seven days a week, um, and it was all built with our own patent and process. So it kind of gives you an idea of, of where we're, we're, we're heading to. Um, but as, as we also, engineering was also a very big part of our, our business, um, and we decided that we could do something with the old mining sites that we, we owned basically the rights to. So we built wind farms in the mid-90s, um, and they were some of the first mid far wind farms in Ireland at the time. Um, they still stand there today, but they're dwarfed by the new wind farms and the, the size capabilities that they have now. So uh, you're probably wondering at this point why I'm here um, and how biochar and renewable fuel com came about. But in about 2010, we decided that the world was changing and coal wasn't going to be around forever, and, and rightly so, and we needed to adapt with, with it. So we set about trying to find a renewable raw material for our bio coal effectively, very similar to Eric's. Actually, the story is, is pretty similar. Um, and we, we kind of settled on, we did a lot of analysis at time, um, and we came up with tarifaction and paralysis as being the, the route to, to our, our new product. Um, so we spent an awful long time developing the product, and, and so, how our biochar and renewable fuel journey is, is um, uh, what I get on to next. So basically, in 2010, after a lot of reading by our manager director at the time, who was Peter Layden, um, we went off and, and hired, or sorry, bought some small-scale lab-based paralysis equipment. Uh, and the person in the picture, you probably see him in the audience if you look, uh, we hired him at the time. So Rob was doing a PhD on tarifaction and paralysis, effectively. Um, and he came and, and operated the machine for us. So. So he spent an awful lot of time with my father um, working out what products would work um, and how we would be able to produce a, a solid fuel replacement effectively. Uh, in 2012, we then decided to take a giant leap and bought a, a device to develop a pilot plant. So we bought some one ton per hour pyrolysis reactors. They didn't operate a one ton per hour at that time. They were, we had spent an awful long time trying to develop up the speed and, and, and our output. Um, but we, uh, we spent an awful long time testing different raw materials um, and took some, a lot of time to decide which ones were best. And eventually we settled on olive pits um, due to their consistency, density, and also um, the fact that they are a fairly sustainable product because they're uh, an agri residue. So I, after between 2012 and 2017, we were developing the product. And in 2017, we actually decided that we were trying to go to market with a a product that was that was made from the one ton per hour plant. So as you can imagine, the product was fairly well received in the Irish market, um, but it took a long time. So we didn't have the capacity to, to scale up to what we needed to require. Um, so I just have some pictures of our process. So it's fairly simple. Our hopper biomass is fed into the hopper, into our tire faction reactor, which is a screw reactor. Um, it's a heated screw, we, we burn this, the syn gases like most of the others here, um, and we get solid residue out. Um, we, we use a, 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 a low and slow, so our temperatures, we don't go up to the temperatures 600 degrees, we get to about between 300 and 450, um, and we take a lot of time in our process, so it's, it's, we, it can be up to two hours, um, so we recover a lot of the density in, in the product, um, which is very important for the, the burning product. Um, and then we can get out some nice tarified material, um, which is put into a nice baking tray and, and basically baked in, and, and put into our finished briquettes and then into our bags. So our, in 2017, Harvest Lane was launched in the Irish product. It was a new renewable bio coal, um, and the feedback was very good. Um, however, we didn't have enough capacity, um, and that became evident quickly, which leads us to kind of where, almost where we are today. 
Um, so in 2023, which was this time last year, actually we purchased a, a 10 ton per hour pyrolysis reactor. So actually two five ton per hour, per hour pyrolysis reactors. Um, we, in, we took delivery of the reactors in April of last year and we installed them across last summer. Um, so we actually, we're, we're running them continuously at the minute. They're, uh, one is, is used as a dryer, the other is used as a reactor. Um, so we actually, our capacity at the minute is five ton per hour, but the phase two is to run them in parallel as two five ton per hour reactors. Um, so, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have gone forward. Um, yeah, so our, our, our reactor is now installed. Um, it was commissioned in November of 2023, um, and we've manufactured close to a thousand ton of biochar since then. Um, unfortunately, we haven't sold it all, um, but we've been manufacturing into our bio coal since then, um, and the product is, is we sold our first bags in November, so, so we're very satisfied with where we are to, to now. Um, but I suppose along with bi bio making biochar for combustion is obviously an important route to market. However, we want to get into biochar for carbon sequestration. Um, so just we just have a few pictures of the plant, and um, that's one of the reactors. Um, that's some of the bio coal with our engineer, um, and that's again the second reactor you'll see working in continuous. Um, and this just some nice pictures of the plant we built. Um, they're not as shiny as some of the other plants, but. They, we've lots of coal around our site still, so you have to forgive us. Um, and we recently had Kathleen Draper on site, um, who everyone would know here from the IBI, and then there's a couple of the Airbnb Irish members as well. Um, so where are we going effectively? Um, so and what can we do? We can provide multiple grades of biochar. So our plant is built to handle every different feedstock or as many feedstocks as possible. Um, however, we have. Our main feedstock is olive pits. We've settled on olive pits at the minute because of their consistency and their density. Um, and they make very, very good biochar. However, because they make very high grade biochar, they're fairly expensive, um, as you can imagine. Uh, however, we are open to using other feedstocks, but we require people to tell us effectively what they need from their biochar. Um, but this, and again, sustainability is one of our key cornerstones. We have been making coal briquettes for a long time, and now we've got a chance to change, so we want to change as far as we can change. Uh, ideally, we get away from combustion also altogether, but mm, that might take some time. Um, and so I suppose like, like a lot of the other biochar facilities, we are carrying out uh, trials across multiple sectors. And um, we've done some trials with some of the building people in, in Ireland, so the cement, uh, agriculture, we're hoping to do some trials with AD plants. Um, fairly soon actually um, and we're working with a lot of universities as well at the same time we've horticulture as well we our, our product actually is going into a compost at the minute and um, so uh, he guy is using chicken litter and he's mixing with chicken litter and some biomass pellets actually and then our biochar and he's making a compost an organic compost um, and it's working quite well for him but again scaling up is, is a problem and um, uh, again, as everyone says, the steelworks require a lot of for combustion. Um, our biochar isn't really suitable for electric arc furnaces because we don't have the, the fixed carbon contents as yet. However, that may come in the future. Um, and then, we, of course, it can be used as, as a combustion product. So we've looked to decarbonize the solid fuel market in, in the Republic of Ireland and the UK, um, and uh, looking to burn it in cement factories, various other factories that are heavy industry users. However, they don't really like the price at present, so things have to change. Um, so our, our past is one of evolution, and our future, future is going to be the same, effectively, we believe. Um, so what, what we plan to do is to decarbonize the domestic solid fuel industry in Ireland and the UK, um, and then any other domestic solid fuel industries that we can find, but they're, they're few and far between in most places. Um, we do want to get into carbon sequestration, so that is our, our medium term, or short term, short to medium term goal. Um, we want, we are setting out on getting certified, um, hopefully with some of the guys that are here at the minute. So um, we're going down that track now in the next few weeks to start it out. Um, because our plant is built, we, we have an advantage over a lot of places. We do then want to get into make a, put an additional biochar facility in the UK and continental Europe. We believe that the 35,000 ton Facilities are kind of the sweet spot of the facility that um, you put in, putting two or two, three of them in the same facility probably works as good. Um, but after a si a sizing up on that, is we find we think it may be difficult, but that's just our, our opinion. Um, so yeah, what we look, want to do is we want to, to talk of, to anyone that's interested in taking large quantities of biochar. We, we actually can produce them at present, so it's very important when people ask 
what's your capability and when can you deliver, we can deliver straight away. So at the minute, we're, f we're fairly focused on the Republic of Ireland domestic market, but that's come March, that kind of our, our cap capacity increases immediately because the demand drops from, for that market. So, so if anyone wants to run some trials, some large trials, we're, we're open to, to help. So we actually have a, a stand over at D15, and we're part of the Erbia Ireland Pavilion. So if anyone wants to come over to us, they, they can. Uh, Siobhan and, and Rob are there for the rest of the day, and, and I'll be there too. So, um, But yeah, that, that's very basically everything. So. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks very much. Now I'll just wait for the presentation to load. Okay. Hi, I'm Seb Byrne. Um, thank you all for your presentations. Very interesting. Um, and now I'd like to tell you a bit about making biochar from poultry litter and how pyrolysis can reduce river pollution. So we are setting up a project with two poultry hubs to process poultry litter into biochar in the Y Valley. Um, I'll go into why we've chosen those locations in a bit more, but the Y Valley is well, it has a river, the River Wye, which runs through Wales and the west of England. Um, and it is a river with a pollution problem. Um, we're looking to process around 40,000 tons of wet poultry litter per year into around 4,600 tons of biochar, 7,000 carbon credits, although we still need to do the LCA and that will be refined, um, and 440 kilowatts of electricity. So I'm going to start by um, going into the pollution problem, as it's critical to what we're doing, and then talk through what currently happens with poultry litter, how we're trying to change things with our project, technology we're going for, and poultry litter biochar. So the River Y is a pretty popular river, um, especially in summer, lots of swimmers, canoeists, kayakers, and for the last few years, it has had a major pollution problem. And that pollution problem, that pollution problem is um, caused by nutrients leaching into the waterways. So the River Wye is in an agricultural area, lots of chicken farms, dairy farms um, in the area, and phosphates run off that land into the waterways, causing algal blooms. The algal blooms limit the light and oxygen within the river, and it kills aquatic plants and fish, and ultimately disrupts the whole ecosystem of the river. So some stats on the River Y: around 70% of the phosphorus is from agriculture in the river. Uh, it's got two and a half times more phosphorus in the river than the national average. 90% of the river plants have been killed in the river due to the algal blooms. And at one point, there was an algal bloom stretching up to 140 miles down the river. So. The, we, we had a look at what the sources of the phosphates were in the river, um, and here you can see some data at various points on the river and the river lugs a tributary, and the predominant cause is agriculture. There's also a significant cause from human sewage wastewater outputs and a bit of other parks, gardens, sports fields, nutrients runoff. Um, and the agriculture, the, the key one for us we, went, we dove, drove down into is 42% of the agricultural phosphate leaching was from poultry litter. The, as I mentioned, the river is pretty popular, and as such, it has been in the press a lot. Uh, all the national newspapers and the BBC have covered it, and Avara, which is one of the large poultry suppliers in the region, um, they've had to act because of that press, and them with their logistic company, Gamba, have um, made a rule that from this month, no poultry litter in the Y Valley catchment area can be spread to land from their farms. Uh, what this means is there's increased truck movements, increased emissions of, um, from the trucks in moving that poultry litter around the country to areas where it can be spread on land. Um, so leaching in the nutrients runoff into the rivers is not the only problem from poultry litter. You also have greenhouse gas, greenhouse gas emissions, um, the two main ones being ammonia and methane. 85% um, of ammonia emissions in the UK are from agriculture, um, and it is a precursor to nitrous oxide, which is vastly more um, potent than CO2. Um, 
and also methane is created when the poultry litter can go through anaerobic uh, decomposition. So if it starts composting during storage or um, in the shed, then it will be releasing methane into the atmosphere, which again is more harmful than CO2 as a greenhouse gas. The local councils in the area have been looking for a solution. Um, and Herefordshire, which is one of the councils which the river, river runs through, has built in, brought in a building moratorium, uh, meaning that at the moment, unless you can prove that the nutrients from a new building of houses is not going into the river, you cannot build your house at the moment. And that's estimated to be about 316 million in lost investment in the county. Um, but then it is a double-edged sword. You've got to remember that the poultry industry is a major uh, employer in the area and that you can't just do away with um, <laughs> poultry farms because ultimately it's, it's a popular meat and people eat a lot of chicken. So what's currently being done with the poultry litter? So the vast majority of it is spread on land or goes into anaerobic digesters. Uh, it is spread on land as a fertilizer. The phosphorus is a valuable and finite resource, and it is needed in um, agriculture for healthy plant growth. But at the same time, it needs to be balanced with damaging waterways, so we need better phosphorus um, stewardship. So what we're looking to do is take some of the excess phosphorus out of that market. So what we can see here is the graph on the right shows that all but one areas of the UK have a net positive phosphorus balance. More phosphorus is going to land that comes off it each year. So we are over applying phosphorus and poultry litter is one of the key sources of that phosphorus. Um, so the land spreading not only um, has the phosphorus and the leaching, but also there's biosecurity risks from the transport. Um, avian flu is a major one I'm sure everyone's heard of. The Environment Agency are also tightening up their rules and enforcing soil analysis to make sure that the land has low phosphorus levels before poultry litter is applied. So if the phosphorus levels are too high, they're having to transport it at cost and emissions further away to other land which has low phosphorus levels. So after looking at that, we, we decided to go look at pyrolysis as a solution to the poultry litter problem in the area. And we are setting up two sites. The first is in Madley in Herefordshire, where we've acquired the site, we've chosen the technology we want to use, we've designed the site, we've agreed an energy offtake agreement, um, we've registered with Puro, and we're currently in the planning phase, and we have a nice, important typo here. We intend to go live September 2024, not <laughs> September 2025. Um, we are collaborating with a lot of parties in the local area because we want to come up with a project that can be replicated and ultimately roll out, more hubs be rolled out around the county and helps um, bring, the, bring the river back to good health. So Avara Poultry Supply, you've got Gamba who are a logistics company. The government, the local councils and EAs we're liaising with environmental groups and FCE is a, a consultant we've been working with around the biosecurity. So, when we started looking at the technology, we knew that we needed to make an economical plant so it can be replicated and ultimately, hopefully in the future, uh, use this model all around the country to make sure that our waterways are healthy. Um, so we started by looking at the properties of poultry litter. We had a number of lab analyses completed um, and we were quite pleasantly surprised with what we found. So the Avara farms where we took the samples from are typically 95% manure, 5% bedding, which is a woody bedding, wood shavings. Um, the moisture contents vary seasonally. Um, the worst case is in winter around 50%. Uh, the fixed carbon was higher than what I was expecting. Ash content a bit lower than I was expecting. Um, and then the gross calorific value is the one that really surprised me. The gross calorific value of 19 megajoules per kilogram is high for a, a manure. Um, but we had a number of assessments done and they kept on coming back with uh, similar figures. So what we took from this is we need to generate um, energy and use the energy from the pyrolysis and, um, and make a revenue from that, a significant rev revenue stream. So we've looked at producing electricity through an ORC and selling that electricity back to the grid. Um, so our technology partner is Woodtech, and that is a picture of their C1000. And the reason why we've gone for them is efficient energy production. So 
It comes with heat exchangers and ORCs, so we can produce that electricity to sell to the grid. It also has uh, safe inline effective drying, low emissions through a gas, wet gas scrubbing, um, and that's good for biosecurity, which I'll come on to, and ultimately, the economics for the plant, uh, they matched up for this technology and the hub that we wanted to do. So the plant design. Um, this is a two machine plant. Uh, the hubs will actually be a four machine plant, but for the, for the sake of the schematic, to make it fit on the page nicely, this is a two one. Um, the way it works is there's a top loader where trucks will come in and deliver the poultry litter. They'll be dumped in there, so we wanted to optimize the interfaces so there's no manual handling, there's no second handling of the, um, the litter. It's dropped straight into the top loader, which delivers it to the augers and it goes into an inline dryer. The inline dryer uses waste heat from the process um, directly with the um, exhaust gases. The and it also preheats the poultry litter before it goes into the C1000. The C1000 converts it to biochar, drops into a water bath to be cooled and quenched before it is discharged, and it is weighed, and the moisture content is recorded. The exhaust gases from the C1000 go through the heat exchanger, and that's where it's converted to water, and the water goes to the ORC to generate the electricity. Um, and then the, g the gases after the heat exchanger go to the wet scrubber and then ultimately out the chimney. One of the, the, the big challenges with poultry litter is drying it so it is suitable for pyrolysis. And we did a bit of a, a look around the market and the dryers which were suitable were pretty expensive to be honest. Um, and as such, we've, we've embarked in developing with WoodTech as a joint venture our own inline dryers. And this is a picture of one of the R&D dryers that we um, have been testing. The, the requirements for the dryer is with, that it was a direct heating with the flue gas, um, suitable for materials such as poultry litter, which has at times poor airflow. Um, so it has agitation in there. And also closed loop. So we knew that the steam, everything coming from that dryer, especially the ammonia, which would be released, needed to go to the scrubber, neutralize the ammonia so we are not um, contributing to greenhouse gas emissions. Sorry, one second. Biosecurity. So avian flu is, is pretty prevalent at the moment, um, and it is one of the key design factors in our hub. The risks from transporting storage um, are not only avian flu, you also have odors, um, dust, wastewater from site that also need to be controlled. So the way we're, we're setting up the site in the, um, the bottom picture is an enclosed top loader. So that would be a negative pressure building. So again, methane and the ammonia um, will be cleaned up before it is released. Um, it also protects us from odors and dust and um, rain. The, the um, steam and the, the emissions from the dryer go through the, the scrubber as well. We have a disinfection um, station on site, so all trucks get disinfected and workers when they come and go from site. Um, we also store the biochar outside, um, segregated. That is for a um, fire reason, just we don't want to keep it in the same building. But ultimately, pyrolysis is a, a good way to denature and kill all the harmful, harmful pathogens in poultry litter. So what, what's the end result? It is um, biochar that is, it is ashier than woody biochar. It has a, a lower carbon content. However, it is still good for agriculture. As, um, as you've got higher ash content, the ash holds a lot of the nutrients. And so the biochar has more nutrients than um, a high carbon biochar. Um, it's killed all the pathogens, it's reduced the weight, so for, in terms of if we're taking it out of the catchment area of the Y Valley, 75% of the weight and therefore trucks and emissions from those trucks is eliminated. Uh, odors, biosecurity risks are all, all eliminated. So we think pyrolysis is really a key solution in the uh, protection of our waterways through leaching. The added benefit is that the biochar can be applied to land with poultry litter if you want, or other nutrients, and it is um, it holds on to those nutrients, reduce, reduces the leaching uh, effect because it releases, releases them slowly into the land. Thank you. That's, ooh.
Excellent. So uh, we have a few minutes for questions. And I think we're going to send out some microphones for that. Did anyone have any questions while they're getting the microphones together? Yes. Hello, thank you for the great presentations. Um, so I'm Sebastian Gros from uh, EDF r and I would have uh, one or maybe two questions for um, Erex. Um, it's uh, the number of references, industrial references you, you have already uh, running, like, uh, and, and what would be their availability. And also uh, for the bio oil, which is co-produced or which will be co-produced and used uh, by the mining company. What is the treatment which is done and also what will be the use at the end? Thank you. Merci. En fait, la première question, je ne suis pas certaine de l'avoir compris, puis je pense que vous êtes français, donc si vous pouvez me la dire en français, je vais être très heureuse. <laughs> oui. Euh, combien de références industrielles euh, en opération vous avez aujourd'hui? OK, oui. Et euh, leur euh, oui, euh, disponibilité le démontrée aussi. Merci. Merci. Donc, en fait, c'est une très bonne question. On a une, euh, une usine en opération actuellement pour ce qui est du biocharbon. Donc, c'est une usine à échelle industrielle. Et sinon, pour ce qui est du biochar, on a des unités euh, qui sont plutôt des unités R&D pilotes. Et le projet Carbonité, ça va être le pro le vraiment le, le premier projet. Donc, ça va être le projet Large Scale qui va être finalement notre espèce de premier euh, méga projet là, qui pourra être répliqué par la suite. Mais c'est pour ça, c'est vraiment le projet exemple euh, initial. Puis, pour ce qui est de la bioville, là, désolée de le dire en français, mais c'est vraiment plus facile pour moi. <rire> Pour ce qui est de la bio en fait, ce n'est pas nous qui faisons le traitement. Donc, évidemment, il y a un traitement, euh, la bio a beaucoup d'eau euh, à l'intérieur. Et donc, euh, il y a un traitement de filtration, mais on a été chanceux parce que sur le site euh, de, du groupe Rimabec, en fait, où est-ce que notre usine va être située, on a euh, un joueur qui s'appelle Bioénergie qui font de leur fonction unique la filtration de la bio pour arriver à une huile pyrolytique qui est ensuite utilisée comme un une espèce de... Je pense que c'est vraiment comme une énergie, là, donc euh, un biodiesel ou quelque chose comme ça euh, pour euh, les gros mining and, uh, players. Puis euh, voilà. Ça fait plaisir. Excellent. Thank you. Are there any other questions from the audience? Hello. Um, I have a question for Seb. Um, have you started thinking about commerci commercialization of the carbon credits? Um, since you're regis registering on Pure, I imagine that's uh, the, the final intention. Uh, we're beginning to. We, have, we haven't looked into it that much, but we've, we've got an overall plan for it. Um, but yeah. Excellent. I think we are at time. Thank you all so much, and thank you to our panelists for your amazing work.